www.ipsos.org and find out more about the International Link Six Sigma Institute. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Paul and listen to Paul with great interest about how we can use data when DOE is not possible. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thanks, John. Um, just before we start, um, if anybody at the end, my email will be up uh, at the end. If anybody wants the slides or any other information, uh, then drop me, a, drop me an email and I'm more than happy to send any slides that you think were, were helpful and things like that. So uh, please, please do that uh, at, the, at the end. Just share my screen. Okay, I think everybody should be able to see that. So, um, as John said, what we're gonna what we're gonna do this morning is I'm I'm sort of gonna take you from the idea of doing a designed experiment, and then we're gonna look across at problems that you might get uh, with doing a DOE. So sometimes you can just do a straight designed experiment. Uh, it's very easy to do. It's very straightforward. It's easy to collect the data. The, the data, the pieces that you're making are quite cheap. The, the test that you're doing is quite easy. Brilliant. If you can do that, that's great. But then sometimes problems start to appear. Maybe some of the variables, some of the, the dials that you want to learn about are more difficult to adjust than others. Um, then the pieces start to get expensive and you start to not want to do an experiment, and maybe you've got data around you. So maybe you've got three years worth of data from some other place, and you want to see if you can learn something from this database that you've got. So what we're going to do is kind of walk through uh, from how easy, an easy DOE and the sort of problems that you might get, but also some of the important things, whether you do a DOE or not. So now, even if you're doing a DOE, it doesn't mean everything's sweet and light and super simple. If you take that approach, you're more than likely going to make a, a mess of things. So we're going to kind of we're going to kind of walk through this. Um, so the the first thing to say is, we, whatever we're doing, we everything's going to be considered a process. Now I'm a manufacturing guy. So each input to my process, I've got inputs. You know, they are going to be, they're going to look like physics to me. Um, all the inputs typically look like physics, time, temperature, and pressure. And then the things that we're measuring out here are things like dimension, strength, maybe cost, etc. So that's the way I look at the world. And because I'm a manufacturing guy, everything I look at typically looks like physics. Occasionally, it looks like chemistry. Um, but it doesn't matter whether the process that you've got is, maybe it's your marketing process. And then you start saying, well, what are the variables? And then you go, do I put an ad online? Versus, do I put ads in, I don't know, a cinema? Do I have a positive message? Do I have a negative message? You know, use my product and the world will be brilliant. Use my product, otherwise bad things will happen to you. That type of, that type of marketing. And you can go through this uh, and identify, you can identify inputs to your marketing process and so every every situation to me can be broken down in this way and as long as what we can do is break this into individual effectively it's like an individual decision they've got to be individual decisions so what you don't want to say is um you don't want to just describe things as a generality. You don't want to say the way we set the machine up. You know, and we, we set the machine up 
like this versus setting the machine up like this. That's a very poor way to learn. What we want to do is to say, now, what time did we use? What temperature did we use? What pressure did we use? They are individual dials, individual things that I can play with as they, they are in that marketing uh, example. And by the way, I've, I've seen an example from Crayola Crayons and they did a marketing DOE. They were going to send out a blanket email to people and they wanted to know how to design the email to the best response. It was going to be a spam email effectively, but sometimes spam attracts us all. Sometimes there's something influential in the email and we, we get attracted to it. And so they had different ways of writing the email. So they had things like, do we have um, a very formal, dear Mr. Jones on the email, or does it say, hi there very informal so formal versus informal sorry that was my fire alarm test um and they and then then they had the body of the email and again they had certain things that they could change and then at the bottom of the email they had do they offer a free gift do they offer a free gift if you reply or not and then they put the email out live in different versions and then they, they analyzed the response rate. And by the way, the difference between the best email and the worst email was a difference in 30% response rate. Not an, not, an insignificant, not an insignificant piece of information to learn. So just because we don't have dials doesn't mean we don't have decisions that are like switches that we can play with and we can then test um, how they influence the response of the, how they influence the response of the process. That's the first thing to say. Everything that we're talking about here is about individual inputs and measurable, uh, measurable outputs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have, if you like, what you might call the perfect, the perfect experiment. I tend to find that this is more um, possible when I'm dealing with machinery. Machinery tends to be, I, I can look at the machine, I've got it under control, I can get everybody else away from it, I can keep other influences away from it. I've usually got dials that I can just set. And so you tend to find the, the perfect DOE is, is easier, quicker, the data comes at you faster when you're dealing with manufacturing processes or machines. As you start to move across here, the one I've just mentioned, marketing, that gets more difficult. Start to get into service sectors. You might have to send the, the experiment out into the big wide world. The, the public have got to do the experiment for you almost. Then you've got to wait for the data to come back. So it starts to get Time starts to get longer here. The, the data starts to get more difficult to get hold of. And then as you go into social settings, the experiment becomes almost impossible. So for example, right now, the, uh, the data set of interest everywhere in the world is all about the, the COVID um, infection. What makes it worse? Is it your age? So, you know, we're talking about, is it your age? Is it your sex? Is it your income? Is it your location? Ethnicity. Yeah. Don't spell it, ethnic, your ethnic group. Yeah. All sorts of things. And so we're, we're trying now to analyze data in a social setting. Now in that setting over here, that is almost impossible to control the experiment in the way that we could control the experiment over here. So it starts to get progressively more difficult and it starts to move into that area that John mentioned where 
dangerous, dangerous. Yeah, stuff. doing the test is either dangerous or unethical or just impossible. So, for instance, you know, uh, doctors, doctors would like to know lifestyle choices. What's the best lifestyle to have so that we all live to we're 120? But you can't force somebody to smoke heavily, drink heavily, and eat lots of fat just to get the test done. Um, that would be slightly unethical. Although there probably are lots of people out there that drink heavily, smoke heavily, and eat lots of fat that you could probably use the data says anyway. Um, but it's but it starts to get more it starts to get more difficult. And so what you tend to do then is this is when you start to analyze what I would call historical data. In other words, the data that you can just grab hold of. So, you know, we, we've got lots of data all over the world at the moment, different areas have collected different data sets. Of course, one of the problems is they've all collected it differently. So that's one of the problems when you start doing historical data. And I guess just one point before we move off this slide that's worth pointing out. Every experiment is a compromise. Every experiment is compromised. So when we're dealing with machinery, we would love to have perfect knowledge. But one thing I can tell you is you are never going to get perfect knowledge. Only your God has perfect knowledge and we're, we're not going to get that. So even, even here where the experiment is possible, you have to compromise. You, you have to let variables go. You have to let inputs uh, go because the experiment gets too complicated. Over here, the compromise is different. The compromise is often in your data set. The compromise might be in your sample size. But pretty much in every situation, you are going to compromise. So you need to learn what are the compromises and how do they hurt you? What do you give up when you compromise, even on a DOE, there are compromises? And you have to decide, well, what am I giving up when I do that? How do I know I've made a good decision or not? This, this type of thing. But every experiment is a compromise. So there's, there's not perfection. Uh, and the one thing that I would say, I'm always looking for knowledge that's useful. So I can tell you lots of fancy mathematical calculations that you could do, lots of fancy mathematical numbers that you could look at, but what's the test of the knowledge that you've learned? Is it any use to you? That's what I'm looking for. And whether it passes some mathematical test or not is by the by to me. You can do some great things with knowledge that a mathematician would not be happy with. So, but in, in manufacturing especially, we, we'll, we'll often compromise and go for something that's useful. And that's what it's about. It's about finding something that's useful. So let's talk about um, issues that you might have trying to do an experiment. So even at the DOE end, so even if you can do a proper experiment, if there is too much noise in the result, and what I mean by that is if you look at your, your graph of interest, if it looks like that, don't do a DOE. It is not going to help you, okay? That, the problem there is not about process knowledge, it's about process control. So the first thing, and I would rule the DOE out, even if I could do a perfect machine-based experiment, if I've got too much noise, I won't do an experiment at all. No use to me. So that's the first one. Um, the next one is maybe some of the variables are not 
settable. So maybe some of your variables in and of themselves are noise. So if I just, let me just go, well, I'll just go back to a, a blank page a second. So earlier I said, oh, lots of my experiments are simple physics. Time, temperature, and pressure. But I could have another input here, which is the outside humidity. Everybody says the humidity has an effect on our result. That's why we got a, a high reject rate. It was the humidity, it was raining or whatever. Now, can I still do a DOE in that situation? Yes, I can. Because what I would do there is, whilst I would do uh, a simple pattern for a couple of the variables like this, what you would do is you would collect data in a special way. So I would do an experiment on a day when humidity is low. I would then do an experiment and collect data when humidity is high. And I might do an experiment when the humidity is at a midpoint. And then when I analyze that data set, I am looking for a setting where there is very little variability. And what that would tell me is that setting is robust to humidity. So there are special experiments for external noise that you can't control. You don't have to give up on a DOE just because one variable isn't, isn't controllable. There's special experiments that cover that. What's the next one then? Um, tests are too expensive or impractical. And I suppose these two, these two probably, these two probably come together. So sometimes what you get is, um, let's think of an example. Let's say you were, let's say you had a manufacturing process that made diamonds. And if we wanted to make diamonds good and bad, that might cost you an awful lot of money in order to do those tests. Therefore, it's too expensive. The other one is um, the test is going to require a piece of uh, measurement equipment, which is currently full. I get this a lot. So lots of my manufacturing clients are using high quality measuring equipment. And of course they're using it a lot because they're using it for the manufacturing process. And then when I come along and say, well, I've got a, some data that I need to collect. I need to measure all these dimensions or I need to measure, I need to x-ray all these parts. They say, we, we don't have the capacity to do all of that testing. So that's when it starts to get more impractical. And the other side of it, the impractical side, is when the combinations can't be met. So sometimes you can't have high temperature and high pressure. Maybe the machine won't stand that. So the combination can't be tested. And in a DOE, if you can't test the combination, then you can't do the DOE. You've got to, you've got to think of something else. So this tends to be, these two at the bottom, this tends to be where we end up saying, maybe what we've got to do is take the historical data, maybe production data, wherever it happens to come from. And we're going to have to try and learn something from a data set that's been randomly collected over over many years all right so now just talking about compromises and problems that you get just go back a second 
So normally, I would want to test this pattern. And what I would want to do is I would want to test that pattern. Going to be noise. I would want that to be in, in a controlled environment. So I want to control the noise as much as I can. So normally when I do a formal test, I'm going to control as much as I can. Now, when you go to historical data, one of the compromises that you're going to have is this is not going to exist. So we're going to have to look out for that when we do the analysis. If we don't have a controlled environment, the data that we analyze might be a problem. So we're going to take a look when we do the analysis that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a little example. We'll have a look whether we think the noise has been controlled or not. The other thing that we'd want to do is we would want to make this box as big as possible. So normally in a DOE, you choose, if this was time here, for example, you might choose time to be at five seconds, time to be at 50 seconds. You choose that. And what I want you to choose is the biggest box you can. So maybe you choose five and 50, maybe you choose 10 and 40. This, this would normally be your choice. And that is in order that we can learn as much as possible. Now again, in historical data, there is a technique to do the same thing. So you are gonna see me create the biggest, effectively, we're trying to create a nice big signal. When you choose to make those two settings as extreme as possible, you are trying to create a signal in your data so that you can see how the machine works. Now, obviously with historical data, we didn't control the pattern. We didn't decide the size of this box. So we have to try and create signals in a slightly different way. But what you're gonna see me do, is you're gonna see me make these signals as big as they can possibly be. All right, so. Um, so the, 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 the commonality between a DOE and historical data, um, I, I need to look out for a noisy environment and I need to try and create signals in my data set. That always exists in every experiment that we do. Let's have a look. Um, so I'm gonna take you now to um, mach a, a machine learning example, which is analyzing a, a, an historical uh, data set. So the reason why this particular example exists is because it was a, a physical product and I could not in the physical product, I couldn't carry out the DOE pattern. So if you think, think of it like this, if I was going to uh, join part A to part B and to part C, and I wanted to work out how much load could the assembly take on this end. Normally, if I was going to do a DOE, maybe this dimension would be at a maximum and a minimum. This dimension would be at a maximum and a minimum. And of course, the same would exist for part B and the same would exist for part C. But when you try and manufacture the parts like that, you often can't do that. So what, what I would be trying to do, of course, I would be trying to make this side of part A be at the maximum at the very time when this side of part A is at the minimum. 
Now, if this was a molded part, I can make the dimension move by ch changing the temperature when I mold. But when I make the part bigger, I will make every dimension bigger. When I make the part smaller, I will make every part, all the, all the parts smaller. So I can't actually set the, the pattern with physical parts in this case. And that's what, what happened with this particular historical example. I'm going to look at a, an assembly where I'm not in control of the individual variables and therefore I can't set a designed experiment pattern. I have to analyze the historical I have to analyze the historical data. So some things that we're going to have to do. Now again, this is the same as a DOE. If I was doing a DOE, I have to select the variables. What is a bad way to proceed is to try and analyze all the variables. I, I would never try to do that, whether I'm doing machine learning analysis or design of experiment analysis. And in that way, what are we going to have to do in order to select the variables? Well, we're going to have to use some skill and experience. We can't throw skill and experience away. So, you know, so you, what, you're, what you're about to see, the analysis that you're about to see me do, I did a little bit of pre-work and we threw about, I think we threw about 15 variables away before I did the analysis. So I didn't just bury the computer in as, in as many numbers as I could, hoping that some fantastic piece of knowledge would fall out of it. I gave the computer what I thought was a good data set where knowledge existed. Because if you bury the computer in lots of crap, you'll have a great deal of difficulty finding the good stuff in amongst it. So you're gonna have to select the variables. The next thing I did was I prepared the data. And I prepared the data to maximize the signals. Okay, so back to what I was saying about making the design space as big as possible. Same same difference when you're doing historical data. We need to we still need to maximize the signals. So I'm going to show you how I did that when we do the analysis. Then the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to analyze the data. And the, before I go any further, I'm going to check whether the data set. I, I'm going to show you what bad data means, but um what would bad data mean? Let me let me give you an example. Let's say we're doing a we're dealing with social science. We want to analyze healthy lifestyle. We have two variables that we think are important. Uh, let's have a think. What are they? How much fat is in your diet? How much sugar is in your diet? Now, what you tend to find is that, unfortunately, those two items come together. So the fat percentage, maybe you've got data, a data set. People have recorded their, their diary. I've told you how much fat is in their diet. But then they also tell you how much sugar is in their diet. And it looks like this. So what you have, look, fat is going up. Sugar is going up. Maybe their age. Uh, let's have a look. Maybe if you don't eat a lot of, maybe if you don't eat a lot of fat and sugar, you'll live to a ripe old age. Um, so maybe then age is going down, but which one, which one did this? I, I see that data set is actually of no use to me. I cannot separate the fat from the sugar. 
Okay, so that would be what I would call a bad data set. I can't learn anything from that data set. I would need to maybe dig a little bit deeper, look for other examples, maybe go and find a different data set that's been collected in a different way. But that's what I would mean by we have a bad data set. That, that pattern there is known as confounding. And when you get two variables confounded, it gets very difficult to learn uh, from that data set. So I'm going to check for bad data. So I'm going to show you how I do that. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a model. So we are going to generate, effectively, we're going to generate a prediction model. When we do that, that gives us an opportunity to check how much noise was in our data set, whether our model is going to be of any use or not. And finally, and I have a spelling mistake on here, that should be an I, we need to confirm the model. In other words, is the model Is the model useful? Does it work? So you get lots of people that generate lots of prediction models. And again, something that the scientists are doing right now is predicting all the um, infection rates and all sorts of things, how fast we're gonna get better and etc. Is the model of any use to us is the real question. Because if it isn't, stop bloody using it. And Paul, I think we just the other day said we a lot of people are using the word validate. I think we agreed it's probably the same word as confirm. Yeah, validate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, validate. Validate very much gets used in um, the health, health and um, maybe chemistry. If you if you're making medicines, the, the 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 medicine authorities they come and they audit your production process and they often ask you to validate your process. Yeah. So yeah, I I would. I would definitely use the word validate as well. Validate the model, confirm the model. Does it work? Yeah. So it's a bit like saying validate your process. Does your process work? Does it make medicine that people want to buy and we're not going to produce something strange and cause problems? So those five stages, select the variables, prepare the data, analyze and check for bad data, create a model, uh, and confirm the model. Um, to be honest, there's a there's an element of you you would do that in any situation, whether it was a DOE or whether it was machine learning. That's just good, just good. Um, it's just good practice. It's good experimental practice. So let me show you. Um, um, I'm going to show you a data set. Um, here it is. So this this data set is uh, it's a motor. So um, we were assembling components that were being supplied from all over the world. Um, the final product was actually making noise, and I mean noise in the sense of decibels noise. And the customer was not happy if the product was noisy it was going into an environment where they needed the, the the sound of the item to be very low to be very quiet so decibels here is a problem now i mentioned earlier that i prepared the data before i started and i selected the variables so the first thing selecting the variables you can see look there's only three variables in this analysis. Now we threw out about, I think we threw about 10 variables away. So all I did, I did some simple regression, just one factor regression. And if I didn't get a reasonable looking link between the input and the output with simple regression, I just, I just threw it away. I don't, I'm not going to confuse the, the computer with noise. So I just, I just threw it out of the analysis. Now, by the way, if I'm wrong, 
it costs me nothing to do this because I can do the analysis, I can go back and I can bring some of the data back into the analysis later. But I want to start simple and I want to see if I can get a model in a, in a simple form before we start using 24 variables in a massive equation that probably won't work. So that's how I that's how I analyzed for variables that I was going to put into this final analysis. Right. So I've done some simple regression. If I can't see any links, I've, I've thrown the I've thrown the item away, and I've got left with these three variables. So this is just the motor, by the way. So the noise here came out of the final pump. But these variables are from the motor only. So we were testing the motor. We were measuring how many amps the motor was pulling, what the RPM was. And on the end was a little mechanical crank. And we could measure the dimension of the crank. So the throw of the crank is in millimeters. Right? So I've got an historical data set. I got thousands of data points, by the way, thousands of data points. I only decided to test 20. Now you can see 19 on the screen. We lost one during the test, okay? So things happen. I started with 20, but I, I lost one while I was collecting the data. Now, which 20 did I pick? This is the important point now. This is where I generated a signal in my data. Because what I did was this, splitting this, this list in half. I picked the 10 lowest results and I picked the 10 highest results based on the output based on the output. Now, what does this do by picking the lowest and the highest? What it does is it puts a massive signal in my output data. Now, by the way, just to point out for those of you that don't know decibels, it doesn't look like these are very different, but the decibel scale is logarithmic. Three decibels doubles the noise energy so three decibels to me is massive all right if i can move this result by three decibels i'm going to get super excited by the result okay so just to put a bit of practicality into this but i've taken the top 10 and the bottom 10 and that's to create signals now the other data is put aside as a confirmation test so if you think about what we've done, we've got the top 10, we've got the bottom 10, and I've got all of this data in the middle. What am I gonna use all the data in the middle for? I'm gonna use it to validate the model. Yeah, so, so I've created a big signal. Then once I've created a big signal, I can I can go back and look at all the noisy data that I've discarded and use that as a confirmation set. All right, so uh, that's that's the way we've done this. Now, by the way, the ten and the ten, you could have gone twenty twenty. There's no there's no hard and fast. I haven't got a hard and fast rule here. I, I've got a feeling that when I did this piece of analysis my software was only capable of taking so many data points and by the way my software runs in excel so it was an excel limitation i believe that limitation no longer exists so excel now takes a bigger data set than it used to so there's a good chance i could have done 40 versus 40. Yeah, i could have taken the top 40 and the bottom 40. so today you could probably put a bit more data in here but there's, there's no hard and fast uh, rule other than what you're going for. Is 
is the high and the low. Okay. So that's that's what we're going to do. So that's how I've set the thing up. I prepared my data, thrown away variables I don't want. I've prepared my data, put it in order, top and bottom, created a nice big signal. Now what I'm going to do, if you remember the little process that I had, I'm going to analyze the data and I'm going to check how good or bad is my data set. So let me go and do that. I'm going to disappear off into Excel now. Okay, so there's the data set. Now what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to analyze this effectively live in front of you folks. So you are going to see me do whatever, exactly what I would do. So you can see that once you've prepared the data, the analysis isn't going to take us very long. This is going to take us, I don't know, 10 minutes, including all the explanation that I'm going to give you about what we're looking at. So it's not a particularly onerous task. Therefore, if you've got historical data, you might as well have a go at analyzing it. You never know what you might learn, right? So, you know, lots of production data and uh, there's lots of data about us these days. We love to collect it. So you, you waste nothing by attempting this technique. Well worth, well worth the try. So let me show you. So here's my data set. I've got the inputs. I've got the, the decibel output there. I'm going to use a piece of software called Sigma Zone. And you can see, look, in my software, I've got something up here called historical custom designs. In other words, I can analyze historical data. I can anal analyze machine data. So if I click on that thing, it says, well, do you want to create a matrix that we can analyze? Yeah, please. And it says, how many factors do you have? How many things are we testing? Oh, three. How many runs do you have? How many data points? Well, in this case, I've got 19. And if I click finish, there's a nice empty table. And I could type the data in manually at this point uh, if I wanted to. But of course, I'm going to do it a little bit quicker. I'm going to copy and paste it. So the data is in the computer. Next, it says interactions, it says coding and repeats. So let's have a look. Now what it's asking me is, how complicated do I want to do the analysis? So in, in the maths, if you have four variables in a process, you're going to get the main effect from the individual dial. You're going to get two-way interactions. You're going to get three-way interactions. You're going to get four-way interactions. Now, normally, if I was doing a proper DOE, I would ask for all of those. But because this is historical data analysis, I don't like to get too greedy because the computer often has trouble trying to create these models. So I'm just going to ask for the two-way interactions. By the way, Simon, uh, is your is your situation chemistry? Uh, no, no, it's more the physics side, it's optics. Say that again, Simon. Uh, no, not chemistry. It's, it's physics. 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 Okay. Yeah. I wasn't I wasn't sure. So I, no. uh, apologies, because what I was just going to say was, if you're doing this in chemistry. And you do this in physics. In physics, three-way and four-way interactions are very rare, you, and you won't get very powerful three ways and four ways. In chemistry, you get massive three-way interactions, massive four-way interactions, and sometimes they go boom. So it's completely different. If you, if someone's looking at this from a chemistry perspective, you would probably want to go deep into the three ways and the four ways. If you're thinking of it from physics, even even social science, by the way, social science has got lots of interactions. You know, the um, 
the sugar is interacting with the fat, is interacting with the fact that you smoke, is interacting with the fact that you you jog or you go to the gym or whatever. There's massive social science interactions. In physics, which is what this is, they're not going to exist. So I'm only going to ask for two ways in this case. I'm going to click next. Then it says, how do you want to code the columns? I'm going to, I'm going to auto code these columns. I'm going to talk about what coding is just so everybody's on the same page once I've done it. So auto code. How many responses do you have? How many things are you measuring? Well, I'm just measuring one thing, it's decibels. And how many repeats do I have for each test? Well, in this case, I've only got one repeat. All right, so click next, and I'll go finish. And now it's waiting for the it's waiting for the data set. So just before we go to that, I just want to talk about coding. Let me just uh, go back to my PowerPoint at this second. When we do a real experiment, we've got time. We're going to go five seconds, ten seconds. The computer doesn't want that. The computer does not want that those numbers. What the computer wants you to do is to call that point minus one and that point plus one. It wants something called coding. And, and this is a technique that makes the mathematics work properly. So when it asked me, do I want to auto code? I said yes to that because I want the computer to be using minus one and plus one values. Now, because it's random data, of course, instead of just having five and ten, this would be minus one and plus one. Maybe what I've got is six and seven and nine in here. So what it will do, it will assign that might be minus point eight, that might be minus point one, nine might be plus what that might be that might be plus point eight it's going to assign coded values yeah so that it's a mathematical thing that if you're not familiar with design of experiments um you should go and look up because it's important and the maths won't work properly without coding so i've auto coded in order to make the maths work properly so back to my back to my excel sheet now the, the yellow field is just waiting for the result set. So if I go and collect the result set, there's the data. Now I'm ready to do some analysis. So I'm gonna go analyze design. First thing I'm gonna do, keep it simple. Let's draw some pictures. Okay, <laughs> now then this graph, this shows you look what amps is doing to the noise result. This shows you what revs per minute is doing to the noise result. This shows me what throw is doing to the noise result. Now obviously these two on the right look like a complete mess. But this one, wow, look at that thing. That's a very, very strong signal in the amps. And it's moving the result. I don't know whether you can see the, the scale. Can you see the scale, folks? Yeah, 46 at the bottom, 51 and a half at the top. That's moved the result by five and a half decibels. That's huge. It's like, at this point, by the way, I'm jumping around the office quite excited because this is looking quite good, right? So I'm already getting quite excited about this analysis. Okay, so that's the first look at it. Now let's get some mathematics to go with it. Analyze re design. Now what I'm going to ask for, look, is multiple regression. So earlier, I talked about the fact that I did simple regression to get rid of variables that I didn't think needed to be analyzed. This is a slightly different technique because what this is going to do is put all the variables in the equation at the same time. 
multiple regression. Okay, so there it is. Now then. So some things I said I would do once we started analyzing the data. Number one, I said I would check if we had bad data. Number two, I would check how much noise I had. Okay, so let's do the second one first. R squared. That figure right there, that 0 0.87. That 0 0.87 is telling me 87% of all the movement in the noise is because of the turns in the model. Only 13% is noise. So what that's telling me is the variables that I threw away are well, okay to be thrown away. They don't do anything. If that number was a lot less, and one, by the way, is the best I can get, if, if, though, if that number was a lot less, then I would be more concerned that maybe I'd thrown some terms away, I'd thrown some data away, that was important. But at 87%, I'm looking good. This is a good data set that I've analyzed. By the way, part of that is because I did the top 10 and the bottom 10. Part of the reason why I get 87 is because of that reason as well. Now then, now I've got to check, is my data good or bad? Have I got problems? Well, what I'm going to look at are the tolerances. Now again, the tolerances should be at one. If I'd done a proper experiment, my tolerance would be at one. And what one is telling me is that this value here, this 2556, that would be 100% independent of everything else that was going on. It isn't mixed. It isn't confounded or linked to other variables. Now you can see, look, my tolerance there is is 0.45. Now what that means is only 45% of that number is clean. It's linked to other terms in the model. All right, so 55% of that signal is coming from somewhere else. So I've got I've got some some linkage in my model. Now by the way, this isn't the worst number I've ever seen. This is quite a good start. All right, so to, to have numbers that are sort of halfway there, that in the 40s, that in the 30s, that's kind of okay, all right? So let's, let's proceed and we'll see if those tolerances improve. Now, one of the things I have to do is remove terms that shouldn't be in the model. So um, we, don't, we don't just take a model at face value. Some terms shouldn't be there. The A-B interaction, for instance, uh, shouldn't be there. Uh, and I'm going to uh, take that away. So I'm going to reanalyze the model without the A-B interaction. And we'll see what happens to the tolerances. So look, you can see now, A-B is gone. Look what's happened to the tolerance for A. Go back, look, 0.45. Now what that's telling me is that term now, that 2.6, 2 that's 89% clean. That's, that's, a great, that's a great tolerance to get. That's telling me this data set's pretty good. By the way, B's gone up as well. Look, that's up at 91 now. Let's take some other terms out of there that shouldn't be there. So the AC and the BC's got to go as well. These terms, these terms shouldn't be in the model. So I'll do it one at a time so you can see. Let's throw the AC away first. Now look, the tolerance for C is improving. The tolerance for A has gone up again. They're both in the 90s. This is looking very good. And finally, I'm going to take the BC interaction out. Okay. Well, those tolerances 
are excellent. Now, they are all 90% clean. So these numbers now are 90% clean. The R squared look has remained at 85%. 85% of the signal is coming from that model right there. And that model is 90% clean. That is a great day at the office. Okay, so, and, and by the way, I don't have many of these to show you. So what often happens is the tolerances are terrible. I start to do the analysis. I get lots of aliasing and confounding, link, linkages between the terms in the model. And it doesn't improve in the way that you just saw. So this was a good day at the office. Now what I can do is go back and do a confirmation test. So the yellow values here, you can see on the screen, they're linked to a prediction value. Let's see if I can color in the prediction value. I can't. They're linked to a prediction value there. Look, so 50.22 decibels. So if I went to one of the 1,000 data points that I'd thrown away, and I measured the amps, and the amps was, let's say, 1.1, the revs per minute was 88, and the throw of the crank was 144. My model is predicting a decibel value of 47.8. What do I do now? I put that item on test, and I see if my prediction agrees with the actual result or not. And that's how you do a confirmation test. You have to make a prediction, and then reality should reality should match it. And if you get that, we got a model that's working. Now we can use it to redesign this motor because obviously this is part of the design of the motor: the amps, the revs, and the throw. What design should I have? What tolerances should I have in order to make the decibels go down? And that, folks, is pretty much how I would analyze historic data. Now, this historic data happens to be based on a machine. But as I've already said, this could be marketing data. It could be social science data. It doesn't have to be physics in this case. You, you would react exactly the same way. You would choose, you would choose the variables that you want to analyze. You would prepare the data with the maximum and the minimum, so you create lots of signals. You do the analysis and use your tolerances. You use your R squared. And if those are looking good, you carry on. You would confirm the model with the data that you haven't used in the analysis. And then you go use it for something positive in your business and you go make more money. Um, and that would be what you would do with your machine learning data. With that, folks, I think I'm done. Um, I don't know whether you want to you want to ask some questions. Yeah, we could put that... you on full screen again, Paul. For yeah, a let me just let me just remind. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll just remind you of the book that I've just released. As John said, the 15% code. By the way, this isn't my offer. This Create 15. If you put it into Lulu, this is their discount. It's only on for the next three days. I, I saw it this morning. It's on till the 21st of May. So. You can buy other books from Lulu and it'll all be 15% off. So it's not just my book. Um, but if you want to go and, if you want to go and uh, look that up, then that'd be fantastic. And if you want to contact me, paul.allen at allenp.co.uk, please drop me an email if you've got any questions that I haven't answered on here. You can also look me up on YouTube, on the ILSI uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so go and do that as well. There's about 60 videos, I think posted on the, some of them are DOE, some of them are lean, some of them are other techniques, SPC, etc. So uh, feel free, folks. But um, with that, um, oh, I'll open myself up to questions. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. And uh, I'd just like to reiterate uh, Paul, Paul's book and also the, uh, the YouTube channel that Paul has the majority of videos on there. We will be putting the recording of this session on that channel as well. 
or if you want to contact me through LinkedIn, I can send you the direct link to the YouTube video that comes from this presentation. Um, so good timing, Paul. Just finished uh, after one hour, and uh, I'd like to uh, open it up for questions, please. I had the uh, I made a comment there, Paul, that um, the tolerance metric that is in Sigma uh, Pro yeah. is is very similar to what is used in Minitab is the uh, variance inflation factor that gives an indication of the amount of uh, co uh, multi collinearity or confounding. Yeah, um, and I and I just wondered if you had any explanation why they call it tolerance because tolerance obviously is used in engineering to mean something completely different. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got to be honest. I, I, I don't know the, the, why they've used the particular name, but you're absolutely right. If, if you, and it's a good point actually, John, about software. So, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we, sat, we sat looking at Minitab the other day, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Chicken in a webinar with Minitab. Yeah. Minitab asks the same question. So, for instance, it asks you to code. So, do you want the, code, the data to be coded? Coded, coded, yeah. And I noticed as, as she went in and she set the data set up, there was a question on there about how do you want to code this data set? So, the, the same sort of questions are there. You're right, Ben, that when you go into Minitab, it's called VIF. So, when you see the table, so you've got my table where I've got the tolerance column. On Minitab, you'll get a column. And at the top of the column, it's called VIF, which you've rightly said is the variance inflation factor. Um, I don't know why they call it a variance inflation factor either, because... Um, it's the, on a different scale, Paul. It's not even zero to one. It's like it's zero to ten. Believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the one thing about the, the, the confounding is it doesn't have to inflate the doesn't have to inflate the signal. It could cancel the signal out. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what I mean? So if if um, let's say eating fat makes you die younger, but of course you do lots of exercise to counter that and that makes you live longer. Well, those two effects cancel each other out. So it's not always an inflation factor for me. Confounding could make both of those variables look unimportant. So they, they might not show up as signals at all in your data set in that situation. So, you know, confounding for me is, a, is an important thing to look out for. But yeah, VIF in Minitab. Hello, Andrea in, in Italy, by the way. Good to see you. Hi everybody. So we have we have uh, Italy, Switzerland, and UK, and uh, Cola is in London, and Al Alumid. Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Hello, I can hear you. Hello, yeah. hello, welcome. Where yeah. where are you based? I'm based in Trondheim, Norway. In, in Norway, I'm based in Norway. Oh, Norway. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Have you got any any questions for Paul Allen? No, for me it's just been uh, an interesting reflection uh, yeah. on theory. And that's just what I wanted. Good. Good. It was it was useful useful for yes. you. Yes. 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 Very Thanks. useful. But the one the one additional thing I'm I'm going to say, John, is that um, again the the webinar that we looked at, which was mini tab, was a lot more. I would say it was a lot more automatic. So in the sense that the computer was building the model and the computer was making all these decisions. And, and I've got to be honest, I, I like to stay in touch with the computer if I can. So some of my software, it, it does more clever things than I actually use it for. Yeah. And part of the reason why I don't switch on the clever bells and whistles is because I don't see what it's doing. So one of the things that you've got to understand is practically, you've got to understand what to do with the model. So 
if you are physically part of the model building structure. For instance, I'll give you a little example of why you would want to stay in touch. If a chief variable is very influential in your model, you'd want to know about that because you can use the cheap variable to make more money. I can pull on the cheap lever, I can make quality go up, and I can make more money with no cost whatsoever. And the computer doesn't know that. The computer doesn't know that that particular lever is cheap. No. So if you're not careful, if you let the computer make the decisions, it'll say to you, turn the temperature up, turn the pressure up, Turn all the expensive things to the high, and it will cost you fortunes if you let the computer just run away with itself. Now, I'm not saying, I, you know, I, I need the computer to do the maths. I need the computer to do the analysis, but I want to stay in touch because when I see something that's valuable, I'll know it's valuable. The computer never knows that. The, the computer's stupid. You know, they don't know that. Unless... Yeah. Now if, you, if you're comparing supplier A to supplier B yeah. and the computer says, please go to supplier B and, and that supplier is all the way around the other side of the world and you're thinking, no, I, I don't want to use that supplier. I want to use supplier A because they're, they're just 100 yards down the road. That practical side, the maths can never understand practical issues. So I like to stay in touch. I don't like to get too automatic. Otherwise, you lose, you lose the money-making capability of, of the knowledge. And Paul, would you, would you uh, advocate putting this into a Black Belt Lean Six Sigma course? Uh, yeah, because it's, it's, um, it's part of what you come up against. Yes. That, that example, I, I was doing a project with a client yes. and uh, that's what I, I came up against that problem. I couldn't have, I couldn't have progressed through the problem if yes. I didn't have, if yes. I didn't have the ability to an, analyze yes. data that we'd already got. Yeah. If you were hiring a black belt, Paul, this is the sort of thing you would like them to understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a, a reasonably standard part of the kit. Yes. Cause I, one of the things I, I, I don't do too often, John, so you know, thinking about what's in a black belt course, sometimes black belt courses, they teach things that you would never use in 30 years of application. And that, then what happens is the student remembers that technique, but they forget the technique that they're going to need. So one of the things I tend to do is I tend to think, Will they need this? Will they need it often? And if they don't, I clear it out of the way and I teach them the good stuff, the stuff that they'll use a lot and let them get experienced at it. And this would be one of the things that you would use quite often, I would say. Some of the non-parametric hypothesis tests would fall into that category. I think, yes, absolutely, yes. You know, the, the moods median test and the and all that kind of... Yeah, Will Coxon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Co yeah, that's right, yeah. Was it? The box Wilcox Cox and test and the Kolomorogov Smirnoff test. Yep, don't. Oh, yeah. Never used it. Box Cox yes, transformations. Yes. Never used one in 23 years. Yeah, I don't like the transformations. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Any other questions, folks? Hi, there is Andrea. Uh, I I have some questions. Sorry, I arrived late. Probably I lost some of the presentation. So maybe the question I'm, I'm going to ask is something that maybe you have already said during the, the presentation. And uh, I didn't get uh, when you were talking about uh, data selection for the uh, when you were analyzing uh, historical data for the design of experiment. Yeah. And uh, correct if I'm wrong, you say you selected the highest and the lowest response. Cool. Yes. yes, so. Talk about Bob and Wow, Paul, I was going to say. Yeah, so one, one of the things you do, and Andrea, Andrea, is you just using an Excel spreadsheet, just sort the data by the output. So in this case, it was decibel measure. 
So all I did was I had a thousand data points and I just sorted them into order with the highest decibel at the top and the lowest decibel at the bottom. Okay. And um, um, so, so would them be, it's like a, um, if you concentrate on the minimum and the maximum, don't you lose information from what's happening in the middle? Uh, now, now what you lose is noise. Can okay. I, let me, let me do my so you validate the model, uh, can I just mention, if you validate the model, you'd be using test data from the middle section, for example. Okay. Right? One of the ways you validate it is with data that you haven't used in the model or from new data. Now, if you find that the test data is not fitting the model and that you do have, say, curvature, then you may have to run the model again and, and, and um, maybe include some points, Paul. Is that? Yeah, what you do, what you do, Andre, if you think about it, if, if I took, because it's very easy to, to put 10,000 data points into the analysis. Take, so take think, the think about that for a second. Yeah. What, what can you see? You know, you, you see only noise. You see only noise, that's right. So what you're doing, you're stripping the noise away and leaving signal. So what you end up with is, is this effect. You've got data here. You've got data here. You create a model. And then, of course, all these data points we try to predict them. And, and if we do predict them, the model is working. So what you're doing, it's, it's a very common misconception that more data means more knowledge. More data means more noise. Okay, so, so practically then once you have the model, because now you show us uh, how to make a model from those uh, tests, uh, from so those are 20 selected data. Yeah. And uh, how do you validate the model? You introduce uh, your uh, expected data from the model you found and the uh, observed data, yes. and you calculate a new R square? Now, you, what you're doing, I, I, di I didn't point it out on the screen, but where I had the prediction value, I also had a prediction window. Yeah. So I had a, an, an absolute value that was, I think it was 47, wasn't it? My, my little example predicted. 47 is the middle, but there is a prediction window. And if you fall inside that prediction window, it's saying this model has confirmed. It's landed okay. where we expected it to land. So you check that all the data are inside the confidence interval. Basically. That's right. Yeah, it's effectively a confidence okay. interval, but it's a confidence interval for a, a regression model. Yeah. So it's, it's slightly different, but yeah, it's, that's exactly what you're doing. And, and your question is, if it doesn't fit, if the, if the test data, the prediction does not fall within the window, then we know that the model is not linear, or we, we, we want to include some of the other terms, like the interaction terms, or some squared terms, some, some quadratic terms. Because yep. Paul, left, you left the quadratic term out, I did, yes. He could have left that in, and um, and and you you the validation and retraining and the terms that Minitabs uses is is training the model with historical data, then testing the model with test data. You go back and forward between training and testing until you find the best model. If there is a step a stepwise or iterative um, method to it. Okay. So, one of the things I would say, one of the things I would say about that, John, again, let me, let me just share my, just share my screen a second again. Is that the, if I was going to do quadratic, I would revisit the data set. If you think about what I did, I, I tested the high, I collected this data and I collected low. 
So effectively, collected data here and data here, which of course allows me to do a linear model. If I thought that quad, the quadratic was was correct, of course what I'm missing is data in the middle to, to create the curve. So if I go and look at the middle data, it should be there, shouldn't it? So what I would do then, John, is I'd add some extra data in, which is at the middle. What those mid values should do is create a curve, and then the curve would work if it was a quadratic model. Which Can I add something to that, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, that only uh, make it, that would probably just make it a linear triangular model, not necessarily quadratic. Well, the, the, the maths, you know, I, I know what you're saying, that what you'd end up with is straight lines if you drew a, exactly. a diagram. But in order to, to fit that mathematically, what the maths will do is, is enter the squared term. So what it's actually doing is it's, it's fitting a curve through the three points. It, it, doesn't fit a, it doesn't fit straight lines through the three points. Okay. So basically, you're adding a middle point to check for linearity, or yes. rather than uh... so you, you'd have to add some data if you wanted to ask for. Because I, I did have the choice, you know, when he'd asked me about terms, I did have the choice to ask for quadratic terms, and in that instance, I didn't. But the, the, you know, John's absolutely right that you could ask for quadratic terms, but then you would offer a slightly different data set to the maths. For it to calculate. Which, by the way, is exactly what is done in a design of experiment. It will initially use just a high level and a low level. Yeah. And then it will, if the model does not fit well enough, it will request you, or in Minitab, it will request you to, to run some experiments with the mid level values. Right? And yeah. it, prompts you to, it prompts you to do that. Yeah, it's identical to a DOE, John, absolutely right. So lots of these techniques, they're slightly different because of the historical nature of the data and the, the way that we're doing it. But actually, they're all sitting on very similar, they're all sitting on very similar techniques. And, and what, what, you know, I, I basic, I've recently learned about uh, machine learning techniques and how this ties in with machine learning is the... The more complex you make your model, the more input variables you put into your model and the higher powers that you run these input variables to, the model will just start to follow the, the data points and have a lot of variation in it. Um, but each time there's a new data point, it's going to be wrong every time. So you get a model with high variance the more you put in it follows the first paul's going to show now the model will just join the dots yeah you can we produce a model that joins the dots very well but it any it's not going to predict your new point very well it's only it's only following the existing points the training data it'll do that you, you put in how many data points have we got one two three yeah. five six Make a very complex model and, and it's going to fit your training data completely, but be useless as a predictive model. Now, the alternative to that, Paul will draw a straight line through those points. And that straight line does not meet, m match the model very well. It's got no curvature to it. We say that has a lot of bias. It has low variability, it has high bias. What the iterative process tries to do is build a model which is between those two lines somewhere. So it's not straight and it's not squiggly. It has a good combination of variation and bias. But this, this takes a number of steps to get to that best model. Would you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, the, 
but it, it, I, I don't know if anybody knows this, but it's, a, it's something I picked up a few years ago. If you have six data points and you raise one of the terms to the power six, you'll get an R squared equal to one. Always. In other words, the model will always go through all the data points. So if you've got a hundred, if you've got a hundred data points in your model and you put a term in there, which is raised to the power of a hundred, you'll get an R squared equal to one. You can always get an R squared equal to one. But as you're saying, every time you get a new data point, it's a mile away. <laughs> it doesn't work. And so, you, but then maybe the, the straight line also doesn't work. So there's then a, there's a compromise point, which is, which is actually following the data properly, and it's not playing mathematical games. And you, you've got to be careful. By following just mathematical numbers like R squared and things like that, there is a danger that you can play mathematical games just to get a good number. But ultimately, the test is, is the model useful? If the answer is yes, and by the way, I've seen R squared, I've seen R squared, 0.3, and I've seen the guy use that model to do fantastic things to a process. So the R squared, yeah, okay, it's a number that we look at and it tells us certain things, but sometimes in certain situations, the R squared don't matter, and you can do, you can do serious damage to your defect rates with, with R squareds that a mathematician would be horrified at. But who cares about mathematicians? We want to make money. The mathematicians just want to add up numbers, don't they? Just a quick question. Thank you for the clarification. Thanks. Just a quick question, Paul. Uh, when, when you've put the model in place, oh, sorry, by the way, um, John, I sent you a private chat. So have a look. Right. Uh, when, you, when you have your pre when you do not get your predicted uh, kind of uh, numbers within the within the predict predicted area, yeah. What uh, what do you then do? Do you go back and recreate the model that okay we didn't get it right or okay. what's the next step basically? Good question. So we predicted that with with a, within a within a, a boundary. And what you're saying is, we landed outside the boundary. Yeah, yes. So what could we do? Well, number one, try a quadratic model. Number two, you could add more variables. But what would be what would be directing you to do that, Colo? Is um, the, the R squared? So the, if the R squared is poor, what it's saying is some of the data that I I decided to leave out, I shouldn't have left it out. I should have included it in the model. So there would be signals telling me what to do next. So the the quadratic model, why would I do the quadratic model? Well, if I got this model and every try time I did a confirmation test, my confirmation test was above the line like that, that's telling me that model is curved. So there'd be, the, the data would be giving you signals to say, try a curve the data would be giving you signals to say, try more terms in the model, try more variables. So basically, you don't make terms, it's like saying, go back to measure. Yeah, 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 in a, in a way, yes. Yeah, yeah. you've got to go back and think again. Um, you know, ultimately, different data set, different test. Right. You know, there's all sorts of things you could do. Um, but the first two, the first two, the, the maths would be giving you signals to help you with the first two. If nothing that you try works, then that's telling you ultimately 
your data set probably isn't good enough. And again, see, why would I go for a different test? My tolerances would be poor. So the, the maths would sort of be telling me what, um, what to do. I mean, to give you, a, I'll give you an example. When I, when I was still working at Sony, uh, today I'd probably get sacked for doing this type of analysis, but um, we did, a, we did a, a, a historical DOE on absenteeism. And we took individual people's records now. I didn't have anybody's name, by the way. So all the <laughs> names came off the data. Nobody's name. But the variables were, so in my mind, one of the variables that I thought would be influential was how far they lived from the factory. That maybe if they lived 25 miles away and they got up in the morning and they were feeling a bit on over, they think, oh, I can't be bothered driving 25 miles to work, you know? So I wanted to know, you know, where did they live? How far from the factory? I wanted to know their sex, so male or female. You know, today I probably wouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, I did whether they were married, whether they had children. We did all sorts of things. But today, I definitely say you're not having the data. And when we did the analysis, the tolerances were so poor. Um, there, was, there, was, there was nothing in the data set that was, that was any any use to us. Um, so there were things like, did they work shifts? And there was good things like, did they work shifts? Did they have a return to work interview? Which department did they work in? Maybe there was a, a particular stressful working environment that people didn't enjoy and therefore they wanted more days off. Um, but nothing, nothing came out to be important, but the tolerances were terrible. So I kind of knew as soon as I pressed the button, Nothing was going to work, and therefore, what did I need to do if I really needed to sort this out? I needed to use a different way of doing it. Because analyzing historical data wasn't going to help. Anybody else, folks? Yeah, I have one question. When you um, chose the data sets, like just the three um, amps, RPM, you did a, just a simple regression, right? Yeah. Was that also done just with the 20 data points or was that done uh, with, uh, with a bigger set? Uh, I, I think I did it with a big, I've got a feeling I did it with a big data set. Okay. I, and I just did one input, one output. And I, I'm not sure the, the, the R squared was very good. Um, I seem to remember that when we did it, Lots of the R squared values were terrible. So I was getting R squared maybe, let's say like this, 0.1, maybe you know, point, point 0.08. So no link between the input and the output at all. Um, and then a few of them, the R squared was sort of 0 0.3. And so they were the ones that I went, oh, that's interesting. It's a bit of a signal. A bit of a signal showing in that data set. We'll, we'll keep that one. So I, I seem to remember lots of the R squared were terrible. So it, it, it wasn't yeah. difficult. It wasn't difficult to decide which ones to throw away. But the ones I kept, the R squared wasn't brilliant either, but it was just so, it was just so much better than the others. It's just a difference, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Yes, Thank you very much. Uh, I have just one more quick question. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, or with regards to response surface methodology, uh, how, do you, how do you relate that to machine learning? I would like to get your opinion. Ooh. Would I do response surface? The thing about response surface, okay, so. When it's outside of the, the uh, design space, Paul, really, you haven't got the data, which is, uh, yeah, historical data is not covering 
anything which is where the optimal settings occur is what is one way to look at it well i would only i, I only use response surfaces when i've got interactions so so because in that example all i had was main effects so i, I only had main effects i didn't have any two ways if i'd have had a two way in there there is a good chance I would have gone and drawn a picture of it. And I would have used response surface. But to me, I, I only use response surfaces when I've, got, when I've got interactions at play and I want to see extra knowledge. Yeah, but in that scenario, uh, do you think, and with what you've seen with machine learning methods today, do you think they would, uh, that will be able to replace uh, or maybe perform better? Uh, I, I, you know, the, the word better is a difficult, uh, is a, a difficult word to define for, for me because um, with, with all of these techniques, what do I want to do? I say this constantly. This is what I want to do. Money. I want to make money. Now, what I can tell you about maths, normally, it doesn't know how to make money. So, working better, you know, you know, do, do you have a... Um, do you can you predict more if you have better uh, models? Precise. So, for me, better models, you know, would be uh, more accurate. Yeah. You know, so that that would I, that's how I would define a better model. But having having a slightly less accurate model might still allow me to make more money. So um, okay, okay. Oh, okay. I I don't get too hung up on. Um, I, 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 I guess, if, I, if, I, if I may, I'll 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 do me me the the. Um, it comes to the it, it comes to the point that there are many different methods that can be used to get to a similar answer, and I was going to make that point. In fact, with Paul's idea of taking the best of the best or the group of highest, the group of lowest, and using that as the starting point, that is that is one method. It's uh, Paul's method of choice. It's a uh, uh, it's easy to understand. It, he, he you don't get lost in the mathematics. Um, it simplifies things, but there are other ways to get the same models in the end. For example, just by, by leaving all of the data in and letting the, letting the, the, the computer sort of do it more crunching and separation for you. And response surface method is a, just another technique that is, is at your disposal. And I think to some extent, your, your question is pointing to the fact that it, it may not be as relevant now because we have other methods that have superseded it. What, what yeah, the, well, that's what I wanted to get your opinion on. Whether yeah. from your experience you've seen that happen, uh, apart from what I can imagine from the theory, I wanted to see if maybe you've seen something different or, so, or to know what you've seen in practice. Yeah, for it's, it's a great question. And, I, and I, I'd be honest that I haven't seen uh, response surface method used recently. Um, okay. and, I, and I think it's, be, it's being superseded to some extent. Okay. But I, 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 yes. I, it's a good conversation to have. And, and I was going to say for follow-up questions, even after we finish this webinar, Paul and myself, very easy to get hold of on LinkedIn, especially if you make, if we can have the conversation like on a video that Paul's posted so that other people can learn from our conversations, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. You know, rather yeah. than have a private conversation, we put it in a, in a comment section of a video um, and other people will jump in with their experience in that, in that way as well. One of the things to build on what you said, John, which is about being superseded. The response surface methodology was invented in the 1950s and that the, they had no computer to do the maths. Yeah. 
And the reason they invented it was to optimize the result. And they could see from the graphs how to optimize the result. And that's why response surface methodology was invented. Today, to optimize a process, I ask the computer. And you get an equ you just get the equation, really. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, once you've got the equation, you just say to the computer, please hit 23. And the computer comes back and goes, here you go, here's how you hit 23. I don't need a graph anymore. So lots of response surface methodology is needed anymore because it has been superseded by the technology. Mm, okay. A lot of times when I use my mind, it's got some, there's some great little tricks with response surface methodology that the computer can't do. So, you know, I'm not saying throw it away, but there's some great things you can do with a response surface. Yeah. You just have to know what to do with it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So as I say, I think we're all open to more questions, but if we could um, find um, even even the posting that we use to promote this uh, with talk, if you could make comments in there or the ILSSI YouTube channel, if you just type into Google ILSSI YouTube channel, you'll find Paul's videos there. This video will be posted there. Um, and um, yeah, we're all learning all the time. Uh, there's so much to to learn in this subject matter. And what we've tried to show is there's a, a great deal to learn from data science to help us in process improvement and um, Lean Six Sigma type activities. So um, with that, I'd like to thank Paul again. Great presentation, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank and you. just keep, keep, uh, keep informed, keep um, in touch and stay safe. We'll hope to see you again on a call very soon. I'll see you in, I'll see you soon, Simon. Yeah, all right. Thank, thank you, you Andrew. Right. Thank see you. you. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Cola. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you. All right.